Montag, der 11. Juli 1994. Monday, the 11th of July 1994, in the Flight Operations Center of German Lufthansa. Here the cockpit crews receive the necessary route and weather information from the flight duty officers. And Lufthansa flight LH720 from Frankfurt to Peking begins, flown in the legendary McDonnell Douglas DC-10. From the once 11-strong Lufthansa DC-10 fleet, only a few are left in service. There has also been a corresponding reduction in staff, and there are no longer any co-pilots. On this flight, therefore, the services of two captains are being used. Stefan Hess, age 54, and Michael Beretz, also 54, both long-serving Lufthansa pilots with more than 16,000 flying hours each. Also present is flight engineer Joachim Sindel. He has been flying for Lufthansa for 21 years and has almost 10,000 hours in his logbook. After preparing for the flight, both pilots and the flight engineer will go to the briefing room where they will meet the 10 cabin crew members. Since crews are made up anew for each trip, a few introductions will be required. Afterwards, the plans for today's flight and for possible emergencies are dealt with. Captain Hess discusses the expected flight time, the route and the cooperation between cockpit and cabin crew. We make this way, the passengers should be very happy, and then we go home to our houses. This is the Juliet Oscar, she steht on Bravo 22. The computer says 9 stunden 22 wollen we in the Luft sein. Stefan Hess, wird auf dem Hinflug nach Stefan Hess will be the flying pilot on the outward flight to Peking to keep in current flying practice. On the return flight to Frankfurt in two days' time, Michael Barretz will be the flying pilot. We will accompany the crew on the flight to the Far East, and we will take the opportunity to show some historic film of the DC-10, which has been in Lufthansa service since 1974. Our DC-10, registration Delta Alpha Delta Juliet Oscar, bears the name Essen. As on every flight, Joachim Sindel first of all carries out an external check. This aircraft entered Lufthansa service on the 10th of March 1975. It may have aged in the meantime, but has by no means become scrap metal yet. The DC-10 still has a permanent place among the fleets of reputable airlines. More than 55 meters long and with a wingspan of some 50 meters, the DC-10 is still one of the largest airliners. In this version, the maximum takeoff weight is 250 tons, and in order to carry this load, the DC-10 has four sets of landing gear, with a total of 12 wheels. Oh, 
da kriegen wir mit 11 Grad kriegen wir auch das maximale Gewicht raus. Das wäre das Max, dann die QNH Correction geht drauf. While Joachim Sindel is carrying out the external check, the pilots are busy with flight preparation in the cockpit. Weights and speeds are being calculated, radio and navigation equipment adjusted. It is 17.10 when loading is complete and our DC-10 is pushed back from the passenger ramp by the tug. There are 184 passengers on board. With a capacity of 232 seats, the plane today is quite full. The distance to Peking on today's route is 8,200 kilometers. And for this, a fuel requirement of 102,000 liters of kerosene has been calculated. An emergency reserve has had to be added to this, and so we have 125,000 liters of fuel on board. During the pushback, the three engines are started in turn. Afterwards, the checklist is read. Overcentered locked. Overcentered locked. Fuel levels. Locked. Ice protection. Open. Hydraulic systems. Checked. Today we take off from runway 07. First of all, the DC-10 has to taxi about three and a half thousand meters. By then we will already have used 750 liters of fuel just for starting the engines and taxiing. Here on the ground, the DC-10 is being steered out from the left seat. There's a special steering wheel for this, connected to the nose wheel, but not to the rudder. We will use the time until takeoff to have a look at the route. There are five standard routes to Peking. We want to fly the one with the shortest flying time, taking account of prevailing winds. So, after takeoff in Frankfurt, we initially head for Rügen, then over the Baltic Sea and past St. Petersburg. Then we will fly over the northern Urals, over Siberia, Mongolia and the Gobi Desert, and finally to Peking, where we will hopefully land at about 10 a.m. local time. On the map, the route seems to be curved, but this is because the Earth is a sphere, and direct routes appear to be distorted. If one were to draw a straight line on this map, the route flown would actually be several hundred kilometers longer. It is 17.30 when we taxi for runway 07 left. A Boeing 737 crosses the takeoff runway in front of us before we receive clearance for takeoff. With today's high summer temperature and a heavy takeoff weight, the takeoff run is long. The DC 10 needs exactly 3,000 meters to reach its liftoff speed of 315 kilometers per hour.
It's, it's, it's a good half an hour after takeoff, and we're over the Baltic Sea. We've reached our cruising altitude of 33,000 feet, which is about 10,000 meters. The DC-10 has a lot to offer passengers. Shorter flying times than the Airbus, a quieter cabin than the Jumbo, and larger windows than both types. The DC-10 is impressive in other respects, too. DC-10 is an inspiring plane, for its pilots and, with all it has to offer, for its passengers too. At our takeoff in Frankfurt, we weighed about 251 tonnes. However, we were close to maximum takeoff weight, but for this aeroplane. There are other versions, for example, those flown by Condor, which can be up to 12 tonnes heavier. With takeoff power set, the engines wind up to 10,800 revolutions per minute. At the same time, they draw in 600 cubic meters of air, which is about the same capacity as your average family house. However, they also use 3 liters of fuel per second. And what do we get for all that? 235 kilonewtons of thrust. Und was kriegen wir dafür? 235 kilonewton Schub. Beim Abheben That's about 55,000 pounds of thrust per engine, of course. Diese Zahlen wirken noch These figures are even more impressive when one thinks that the DC-10 was already on the market at the beginning of the 1970s. At that time, it was a very high-tech aeroplane. This early Lufthansa promotional film, The Long Haul Specialist, was produced to introduce the DC-10 to the German public. It emphasized the use of new materials and modern construction techniques at the McDonnell Douglas Long Beach factory. A DC-10 is big, 50 meters long and with a fuselage 6 meters across. The tail is as high as a six-story building. Various versions of the DC-10 were built. One was used for air-to-air -air refueling by the United States Air Force, who bought 60 examples. A total of 386 civilian versions were eventually sold, in three main versions. The first, the 10 series, was fitted with General Electric motors, which together generate about 120,000 pounds of thrust. The 10 series is a mid-range version, intended for flights within the USA or short routes across the Atlantic. Two long-haul versions were built, both with engines producing over 155,000 pounds of thrust. The 30 series has General Electric engines and the 40 series has Pratt & Whitney power units. All Lufthansa's DC-10s are 30 series models.
All three versions can carry over 300 passengers, but the long-haul versions can fly more than 6,000 miles non-stop. Later, another variation, the 15 series, was developed. It first flew in 1981, but only a few were ever built. In the 1970s, airliners invariably had a three-crew cockpit. Today, that is the exception, and it seems likely that the job of flight engineer will in time disappear altogether. In the DC-10, though, the flight engineer still has an important role. Joachim Siemdel explains. We have three jobs here, uh, two for pilots and one for the flight engineer. The pilots are mainly concerned with flying and navigational tasks, while the flight engineer monitors and takes care of the aeroplane systems. For example, the flight systems include the hydraulics, electrics, pneumatics and air conditioning, and the engine instruments. Yeah, also, during the really interesting phases of the flight, i.e. takeoff, climbing, descending or landing, I oversee the things to do with flying and navigation as well, uh, such as course, speed, height, and it goes without saying, the aeroplane configuration, the position of the flaps, slats and landing gear. How do you go about monitoring the DC-10's instruments on a long-haul flight? Yes, uh, we, well, we have a special procedure for that. We go over our circuit diagrams in a certain flow pattern and then test the instrument, the indicators and warning lights. Naturally, we can't do that for nine hours, mainly because we have over 500 warning lights, 16 acoustic warnings and 700 fuses. You can't keep an eye on them all the time. Therefore, there's a master warning system on the aircraft. If a fault occurs anywhere, it's indicated centrally, and then we take care of the problem. In the meantime, it is 2030 hours Frankfurt local time. We have 2,500 kilometers of the route behind us, and already we are far into Russian airspace. Gerade überfliegen wir die nördliche Wiener, ein Fluss, der bei einem Blick aus dem Cockpitfenster gut zu erkennen ist. At the moment, we are flying over the Dwina, a river that is easily recognizable from the cockpit window. We are now flying over thinly populated territory with few radio beacon stations and so navigation is mainly based on the INS, Inertial Navigation System, which we want to tell you about later. The airspeed indicator is showing Mach 0.82. With a prevailing 40 knot tailwind, that's giving a true airspeed of 474 knots and a ground speed of a good 950 kilometers per hour. We're currently flying at 11,000 meters. Here in Russian airspace, the flight controllers give the height in meters. The cockpit crew's main task at the moment is to give out regular announcements of position, to navigate and to monitor the aeroplane systems, in particular the autopilot. Meanwhile, the passengers enjoy the comfort which the spacious DC-10 has always given.
This early promotional film was regularly used by Lufthansa. Here it shows how Lufthansa fitted out the aircraft interiors with an emphasis on the final result. A flight in a DC-10 is also pleasant for passengers because it flies comparatively smoothly even when there is turbulence on account of its relatively high wing loading. The cockpit crews were also bound to regret it when the last DC-10 left Lufthansa at the end of November 1994. When it was introduced it included many technical innovations. This early film emphasized things that we take for granted today, such as passenger comfort and facilities. Technical innovations are also explained, for example, modern landing systems and engine reliability.
Unfortunately, the DC-10 fell into disrepute for some time on account of some spectacular accidents, a reaction which was promoted by the media, but not really shared by the experts. During the 20 years that the DC-10 has been in operation with the world's airlines, it has proved itself to be an extraordinarily reliable aeroplane. I haven't ever experienced a really serious problem such as an engine failure. Well, this is partly because the engines are very reliable. Some of them stay up to 20,000 hours under the wing before they're then replaced as a precaution. The last problem I can remember was about one and a half years ago, and then one of the bleed valves wouldn't open. That meant air couldn't be drawn from one of the engines for supplying an air conditioning unit. However, as we have three of these units and we're able to connect them to each other, there was no problem in completing the flight and no reduction in passenger comfort. But what do you do if the system is indicated as faulty? I can demonstrate that best by a small example. I just take the third generator from the bus. Now, as you can see, a warning light has come on, the generator three off light. Additionally, the previously mentioned master caution warning has come on. We then refer to the abnormal procedure booklet. Procedure booklet. If required, I then open the appropriate side of the electrical system and you can see the words engine generator off light on. That's the case here and we would calmly work through the set procedure together in order to overcome the fault. Und dann werden wir dieses Verfahren ohne Hetze und ganz in Ruhe gemeinsam durchgehen, um dann auch äh, diesen Fehler erfolgreich überspielen zu können. In the meantime, it is almost midnight, Frankfurt time. We're flying over Siberia. Below us is the largest coal deposit on Earth. More than half of the route now lies behind us. Less than 10 minutes later and it's light again in the cockpit. As we are flying against the sun, sunrise takes place very quickly. In summer it never really gets dark on the route at all, even if the flight goes through the night. That's because the route goes over relatively northern latitudes. In the 20 or so years that our DC-10 Essen has been in service with Lufthansa, it has spent more than 85,000 hours in the air and has flown more than 30 million miles. The 85,000 flying hours is also the original expected life of the aircraft, although experience gained over years of operating the type allowed this to be increased to 120,000 hours. Wurde diese Zeit von der Zulassungsbehörde inzwischen jedoch auf 120.000 Stunden heraufgesetzt. Nach all den Jahren ist es kein Wunder. After all these years, it's not surprising if the instruments in the DC-10 cockpit, for example the weather radar, seem rather antiquated compared to modern glass cockpits. With the introduction of the DC-10, the workloads in the cockpit effectively changed. Just one example of this was the ability to carry out landings with almost no visibility.
This technical progress has brought about a different kind of teamwork within the cockpit crew. Teamwork is somewhat different from individual work with regard to overall quality. Previously, the man in the left seat did everything and the decision-making process came from him alone. A small group of highly qualified colleagues usually brings a synergistic effect. In order to make use of that, a crew coordination concept was established, which divided the workload and assigned various clearly defined areas of responsibility. These procedures then had to be standardized and published, and the DC-10 was the first to introduce and achieve that. Today, well, it's the norm. Arbeit verteilte und ganz klar Aufgabenbereiche zugewiesen hat. Dazu mussten natürlich auch dann Verfahren normiert, festgeschrieben werden. Und das hat die DC-10, heute ist es allgemein üblich, damals wohl zuerst eingeführt und erarbeitet. In Germany, it's quarter past midnight when we fly over Mongolia on our way to Peking. The radio beacons are very sparse here, and before long we're relying on our own onboard facilities to navigate correctly. We do that with the internal navigation system, which leads us over waypoints. These waypoints are described by their coordinates, as, for example, this one at Dano. In this way, this point does not have to be marked additionally with a radio beacon. Let's take a final look at archive footage of this remarkable aircraft. In the DC-10, it's possible to house the kitchen installations in the underfloor area. Generally, charter operators fly it in this way. And what is more, there is the facility originally introduced by Lufthansa for carrying freight containers in the rear part of the cabin, for those routes where there's a high proportion of cargo and the passenger quota does not have to be totally filled völlig ausgenutzt werden muss. Seit langen Jahren ist das eine reine Passagierversion. Für viele Jahre ist es eine reine Passagierversion. 
Today, on this flight to Peking, we have 80% uh, passenger load factor. And nevertheless, we're also carrying just over 9 tonnes of cargo and we are carrying 700 kilograms of mail on this flight. But that also earns money for the airline. It's 9.20 a.m. local time. For 15 minutes we've been in Chinese airspace and now find ourselves over the mountains northwest of Peking. Here we leave our cruising altitude and begin our descent. The weather in Peking is foggy, typical meteorological conditions for this time of year. This isn't a problem for us though, because Peking Airport has the technical installations necessary for a so-called Category 1 approach. The required minimum visibility of 800 meters and a cloud base above 60 meters is present today. At exactly 9.42 a.m. local time, we land in Peking, the capital city of the most highly populated country in the world. As the winds were very favorable, we arrived 10 minutes earlier than expected. Flights in this direction generally benefit from a favorable wind direction, whereas westerly flights do not. The flight to Peking took about nine and a half hours of flying time, whereas the one back to Frankfurt is scheduled to take 10 hours, 25 minutes. We are taxiing now with our DC-10 for another few hundred meters to the parking position. In Frankfurt, it is now 2.45 a.m. For the crew members, there is no point in changing the onboard time, as the aircraft will be going straight back to Frankfurt. We will accompany them back tomorrow. It is Wednesday the 13th of July when we start again for the flight to Frankfurt with another DC-10 which arrived from Frankfurt a good two hours ago. We want to use this flight to discover a little more about the cockpit of the DC-10. First of all, the takeoff from runway 36 left. Get up, here, up. 
The takeoff route demands that a full circle is flown shortly after takeoff to gain height. This is because to the north the terrain climbs steeply and in the event of a possible engine failure the aircraft might otherwise have insufficient height to return safely to the airport. Therefore we fly over Peking Airport once again and after that depart on a northwesterly course. About 40 minutes after takeoff, we are over the Gobi Desert, where there are very interesting cloud formations. On this flight, Mr. Beretz is the flying pilot. Mr. Beretz, could you perhaps just briefly explain to us the DC-10's instruments? Yes, of course. Here in front of me are the flight guidance and navigation instruments. There we have the autopilot, power unit monitoring instruments. Those are secondary instruments in case one of the main ones fail. Then here we have the throttles for the three engines. And here the communications instruments, such as radios with frequency settings, etc. Could you explain some of the flight engineer's instrument panel to us, please? Certainly. We begin here with the hydraulic system, and as one can see, we have everything available in triplicate. That's due to the fact that our aeroplane has three engines. On each engine, there are hydraulic pumps. Therefore, we have three systems. The electrical system is here. Three engines means three generators and the corresponding warning lights and service switches. Over there we have the instrumentation and control for our auxiliary power unit, the APU, which we can use on the ground to provide our own electrical power. Then we continue with the fuel system. There are three main tanks, one tank for each engine, plus one additional or auxiliary tank. However, this auxiliary tank is the biggest, holding exactly 39 and a half tons of kerosene. Over there is the pneumatic system, which is again also divided into three parts, as there are three engines. Then there are the temperature controls for the cabin and also for the cargo compartment. Today we have goldfish in the cargo compartment. They weigh 630 kilos in all and naturally need a certain temperature. Over there are the warning systems for fire and smoke inside the cargo compartment and the fire extinguisher controls for operating special extinguishing cylinders. Then we have the cabin pressure regulation system. We try to keep the pressure in the cabin as high as possible so that the conditions are as pleasant as possible for our passengers. Here we have indicators showing the temperature of the brakes with overheat warning lights. Now the pilots are very cautious about braking. We don't want passengers to be disturbed, so these warnings are rarely seen. Außerdem sollen die Passagiere ja nicht aus ihren Sitzen fallen. 
Then, of course, we need water in the aeroplane for making coffee, washing hands, etc. There are three water supply systems with three indicators for water levels situated in the tanks. And that essentially completes the flight engineer's instrument panels. On the approach to Frankfurt, the clouds again provide a spectacular view, one which can enthuse even the older pilots over and over again. On final approach, though, romanticism is out of place and the crew now has to concentrate on landing. For this DC-10, it is the 18,177th landing, and there will not be many more with Lufthansa. Although good for many thousands of flights yet, it will shortly be sold. Lufthansa's DC-10s have been used on many long-distance routes. They've been to the highest airport in the world in La Paz and to the most remote in Kathmandu. Many routes were established with them, like to Peking on 7th of April 1980. <laughs> It is the 1st of December 1994, and DC-10s have flown with Lufthansa for the last time. A farewell party marks the end of an era for this legendary jet, which was so popular with its crews. For many guests, the day gives them the opportunity of casting a nostalgic backward glance. Even Captain Martin Gable, chairman of Lufthansa, unwillingly takes leave of the DC-10. Flugstunden hinter sich gebracht. Das ist ungefähr die Leistung, die die gesamte Lufthansa in drei Jahren fliegt. Das hat dieses Flugzeug geflogen. Most of the pilots have already been retrained on the Airbus A340, which replaces the DC-10 on most routes. Otherwise, they'll be moving to Condor, the Lufthansa charter airline, which will use the DC-10 for many years to come. This aeroplane will not be on the scrap heap for a long time yet. Und bei vielen weiteren Airlines der Welt wird die DC-10 noch viele Jahre weiterfliegen. Dieses Flugzeug gehört also noch lange nicht zum alten Eisen. Now it's been retired, the aircraft will undergo a D-check. That's a general overhaul, which takes about four to six weeks. The aeroplane will be completely stripped, inspected and rebuilt, uh, and should then be as good as any other plane, which perhaps is only three or four years old.
immer noch intakt und nach einer Generalüberholung wieder wie neu. The history of the DC-10 is in no way finished. Of the 386 civil aircraft built, more than 300 are still in operation. Joachim Sindel will continue flying the DC-10 as a flight engineer. He's moving to Condor. Michael Barretz is also continuing on the DC-10. He's unable to be present at this party because he's already on duty again. Many captains, however, will retire with the DC-10, like Stefan Hess, whose granddaughter, Kira, may one day be an airline pilot herself. If he's lucky enough, an airman could let his hobby become his profession. It's a problem when he has to retire because, you know, you, you develop a certain rhythm of life, as you do when you're flying the long haul routes, getting used to time zones and differences and so forth. However, I will return to my hobby and continue flying. After all, what else is there to do? Thank you.